Greetings, listeners. Welcome to ICC's Game of the Week with your host, Joel Benjamin. Young American players Ray Robson and Fabiano Caruana again acquitted themselves well in the Reykjavik Open. But in the end, Chinese stars Wang Hao and Wang Yue took top honors along with Icelandic GM Hannes Stephenson. The trio tallied seven points from nine. Carolina led early, but finished a half a point behind the winners. He met his undoing in round seven at the hands of Wang Hao, who triumphed with a nifty piece of home analysis. If Fabiano is showing weakness, it's, it's in his opening preparation, which seems to be a step behind his fellow 2,600 players. Though only born in 1989 himself, Wang showed an experience edge over his even younger opponent. Let's have a look. All right, we have the Chinese Grandmaster Wang Hao uh, playing white, uh, already very impressive 2665 rating. I believe he's the number three uh, junior in the world, which is uh, quite a feat. And playing against Fabiana Carana, the young Italian-American star. I believe he's 15 now. And we have a Slav defense. And D takes C4. I believe that uh, we have not yet to had this, this opening in Game of the Week. Um, one thing, uh, if you're not an advanced player, uh, it's important to take into account that in the Slav defense, when black plays c6, you do have to take into account this uh, uh, capture on c4, that it might be a real gambit. Uh, if white plays e4 to take that pawn back after b5, it is a real gambit. And white here, uh, white can certainly do this, but he's sacrificing a pawn. So generally, a4 is the move played to prevent b5. And then white will recoup the pawn, but black is hoping that a4 might be a little bit weakening. The b4 square will be at his disposal. So bishop f5, that's the main move. And now here, the simplest variation is for white is to display e3 and recapture the pawn on c4 with the bishop. But an aggressive and very popular move here is knight to e5. And here white might well take that pawn on c4 with the knight and perhaps build a center with f3 and e4 or maybe Fianchetto, the uh, king bishop. Now here, Carana plays knight bd7 and the main alternative to that is e6. After e6, f3, white is getting ready to play e4 here. And now there are uh, various uh, complicated variations. One of them, bishop b4, e4, bishop takes e4, pawn takes, peace sacrifice, and we have a long variation beginning with these moves. White's king takes a little stroll. And uh, we play a position where black is uh, down a piece, certainly has several pawns for it. And that position was debated quite a bit over the years. Uh, we don't see it very much anymore, so perhaps uh, black players have lost faith in this variation. But uh, I'd like to give you a little historical overview on, uh, on the opening, especially because we haven't had this one before. So that's what could happen, e6 f3, bishop, b4. More recently, c5 has gotten attention. And after e4, the older move here is taking on d4. e takes f5. Now d takes c3 is not so great because white trades queens and can take this rook in the corner. So instead, knight c6, and here, white usually takes on e6 and gives, gives back the piece. And 
position is uh, probably better for white. Thus, after e4, uh, Kramnik had the idea to play bishop g6, novelty played against Topalov, <laughs> and after bishop e3, he takes on d4. I saw uh, Irish grandmaster Alex Baborin describe bishop g6 as a slightly masochistic idea. Uh, who but uh, Kramnik would really want to defend this position. It's a bit passive line for black, very solid, but uh, not a lot of fun to play. But anyway, he uh, did uh, reasonably well with it against Topalov. All right, well, that's really enough about um, e6. Let's get back to knight bd7, the move in the game. Knight takes c4. And now here, uh, queen c7 has been the main line for a long time. There follows g3, e5, d takes e5, knight e5, bishop f4. I used to like to play this position in the early 80s. I won some very nice positions, sorry, very nice games from the white, uh, white side. The knight fd7, bishop g2. Uh, white generally had a comfortable edge here. But then Morosevich kind of uh, just uh, blew everything up with the move g5. Um, the bishop uh, can't take that pawn on g5 because it gives up the pin. And the idea is uh, knight takes e5, black is going to take the bishop on f4. So generally white plays knight e3. And then black uh, castles queen side and uh, we have an extremely sharp position. And that's been played in a number of games. Now, as I said, openings are not really a big strong point for Carana. It's understandable that he doesn't go for the uh, heavily analyzed lines. He plays a more solid continuation, knight b6, knight to e5, and now simply a5, freezing that a pawn in its tracks so it doesn't drive the knight away, and securing the b4 square for later use. Wang Hao plays g3, Finchetto, um, looking to expand with e4 later. Now knight fd7. I'm not crazy about this move. I think that uh, a better way for black to go here was e6. And the game could continue bishop g2, bishop to b4, holding up the e4 advance, at least for a while. Castles castles, um, e3, probably uh, here h6 is a sensible move, queen e2, uh, black could retreat to bishop to h7, rook d1, getting ready maybe to play e4. In this position, uh, white has a slight pull. Uh, he has a central preponderance. He's occupying it. Black is not really chipping away at it yet. But on the other hand, black's position is quite solid. And it's uh, not going to be easy for white to affect any kind of breakthrough. So it's probably the best that, uh, that black can do here. Although this uh, move knight fd7 has, has been tested out quite a bit. White trades on d7, e4, dominating the center. Bishop h3. Now black is normally very happy to get some exchanges in. But there is a problem that after bishop h3, queen h3, queen b3, we see problems for black. He's kind of one move slow. Uh, he's going to have to defend the threat of queen takes knight in a very awkward way. Rook a6. He definitely does not want to have to play this move. And still this b7 pawn is undefended behind the knight so that the knight is not in any position to move. Well, white can try to exploit that awkward situation on the queen side in different ways. Bishop e3 is one way to do it. But it's been found that after e6, d5, bishop b4, black is really just in time to uh, deal with this threat and uh, seems to come out okay. And don't forget that in this position, white has uh, forsaken castle and king side. 
uh, so he does not have that as an option. Instead, bishop f4, and this is a stronger move. The bishop might come to c7 to drive away the knight. e6, and now a very nice finesse for white. Bishop to e5. And uh, Wang Hao is trying to uh, freeze that uh, bishop on f8, tie it down to the g7 pawn. And it's a bit of a dilemma for black. Um, if he plays f6 to drive the bishop away, then this e6 pawn is weakened. Bishop c7, uh, bishop b4, castles. Now, probably king f7 is the best move for black. If he castles, then knight e2 looks even stronger coming around to f4. And there's some pressure on the e6 pawn. And certainly makes a big difference to get that move f6 in. Uh, to weaken the black structure. Um, probably this was a, even so a better way for uh, black to play um, because the game continuation showed that uh, uh, the alternative uh, that Karana played probably just doesn't work at all. And the movie played here is Bishop B4, a very risky decision, uh, but keep in mind that uh, Caron is still following uh, somewhat established theory. This position, uh, these moves have still occurred. And bishop takes g7 now. This is more than just grabbing a pawn, uh, grabbing a pawn and coming back and losing a little bit of time. But the uh, most important thing about taking that g7 pawn is that black will lose the castling privilege. Therefore, he won't be able to uh, evacuate his king out of the center, and uh, that creates a big problem, a lot of tactical problems for him, and we're going to see that that uh, ends up being a decisive factor. So the bishop retreats, queen g2, and uh, white castles queenside. Now in this position, black well, can take this pawn in f2, but uh, then basically white maintains all of his trumps. Uh, he has this very nice center here, and uh, black pieces uh, really don't have good places to go to. So white would maintain an advantage here. Um, the fact that the black king is stuck in the center, I think, is uh, more of a problem than the white king being a little bit airy with the queen side, not having a lot of uh, pawn cover on the queen side. Um, white maintains an advantage. Although perhaps maybe that's might be the lesser evil. After Bishop takes c3, again Caron is following games that have been played, and in this position, Queen takes c3 was played by Aronian, certainly a good recommendation against Carlson in their uh, sixth match game from Alista. And here Black plays Queen takes e4, and. Uh, Rook d1, queen d5, b3, solidifying the queen side. But now after uh, knight to d7, uh, well, black would probably have um, a uh, solid position. But after bishop takes c3, Wang Hao takes back with a pawn on c3, and this appears to be a very strong novelty. Uh, white actually opens his, his king position up a little bit, but he uh, brings that pawn in the center, gets more central control, and he's getting ready to drive away that knight from b6. The queen takes e4, c4. White sets up a strong threat of c5. And as I said, since black can't castle, uh, if that queen gets to b7, it's going to create huge threats. So after c4, queen e2 was played, c5, and now it seems that queen to c4 check is a forced move. Um, the game continuation shows that uh, this is necessary. Now, after queen takes queen, knight takes queen, bishop retreats, 
and black can get in b5, and then probably king c2. Very interesting endgame position. At first glance, it looks like black can be doing well. He's got his queenside majority going, and his knight on c4 seems to be nicely outposted, but actually it's not. If that knight were on d5, I'd say that black uh, could be quite comfortable here. But actually, the knight on c4 creates problems. White has plan of uh, piling up on the b5 pawn, and there's various ways to do it. White can play rook to d3, rook to b1, double rooks like that. Or king to c2, after king c2, again, uh, king can come to c3, rook b1, and uh, create pressure that way. The problem is that if black ever plays the pawn up to b4, creating a nice protected pass pawn there, uh, white will attack this knight, and the knight will have to go to a3. It's really kind of off in oblivion there. It has no moves. It's stuck on the side. And white is essentially playing with an extra piece if that should happen. So I think black needs to, to avoid that move before. But it's not at all easy to do when you consider the fact that this b8 square that black might use to, to uh, defend that pawn from with, the, with his rook is uh, controlled by the white bishop. So if white doubles rooks on that pawn, it's... Uh, Pretty difficult to do anything about it. So in this end, this end game looks quite promising for white and may put this line, at least uh, from a certain point, out of business for black. Karana played knight to d5. And the idea is that um, if uh, white is not careful in the way that he grabs this uh, Pawn on b7, black will get a uh, very nice counterplay. So, for instance, if uh, rook he1 seems a natural move to bring the rook to the center, queen takes f2. Now, rook f1 doesn't achieve anything positive in, in, uh, at any rate because queen e3 check, that square is not covered. So, if you grab the pawn now, Knight to b4, creating the counter mate threat on c2. And the best that white has now is actually just a perpetual check. So rook h e1 is a definite mistake, but after Wang Hao's move, we see that black is in very big trouble. He plays rook d e1. This is a very accurate move because now if queen takes f2, now rook f1, because the e3 square is covered by the rook on e1, and black has to move the queen away somewhere. Now queen takes b7, not only hits this rook and hits the c8 check, but also f7 is hanging with check, and that's pretty much game over. So after uh, rook d e1, um, Karan had to retreat his queen away from the action, and that uh, enables white to have a decisive initiative. Queen h5, queen takes b7, knight to b4. And this is an interesting moment here in the game. I like what uh, the decision that uh, Wang Hao makes here. Um, very possibly white can grab this rook, queen c8 check, and now either with throwing in bishop d6 check or not, queen takes g8. However, in that case, now black gets to uh, make some counter threats. Uh, queen f5, for instance, with a mate threat on uh, c2. If uh, rook e2, queen to f3. And I'm not sure that this necessarily works for black, but it certainly is a lot closer than white needs to be. Uh, and it's just kind of a good practical lesson that when you're well on top in a, in a position, 
you have one option is to grab material but give your opponent strong counterplay. If you have another option, uh, you might very well look into that. And this other option is really uh, much stronger, wins the game without any questions, and that's to play bishop to d6. And this threatens uh, checkmate on e7. Black has uh, really no choice. Uh, he has to retreat the queen, beginning with queen g5 check, and queen d8. It's the only way to defend. And it almost defends, but uh, Wang Hao has uh, prepared the, uh, the winning uh, combination here. Rook takes e6 check, pawn takes is forced, and now the queen slides across the board. Queen takes h7. And this is completely decisive because black has no way to save the rook. Um, perhaps relatively best is rook to g4, but uh, here white has queen h5 check, uh, picking up the rook, and uh, he's, uh, well, he's up uh, several pawns in the end game. It looks pretty comfortable there. Uh, alternatively, rook f8, queen g6 check, now rook f7, uh, queen g8 check, queen takes e6, might even win, but this wins the rook. So king d7, queen g7 check, and white just grabs a rook and has an end game with three extra pawns, a uh, very simple position to win. So after this queen takes h7 move, winning back the rook, uh, Fabiano realized the position is quite hopeless and uh, resigned. So that uh, proved to be a decisive game in the tournament. Uh, Wang Hao uh, went on to tie for first, and uh, Fabiano, who had been leading, he could not uh, quite catch up, finished half a point behind the winners, uh, although still uh, an excellent result for him. And um, we have a very interesting world situation, I think, when you have international tournaments in uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, that are won by uh, Chinese grandmasters. Uh, the world has certainly changed a lot uh, since uh, I started playing on the international circuit, but uh, you see players that you d wouldn't expect to see in, in various tournaments now, and um, certainly uh, uh, the chess world is richer for it, uh, although maybe not so much the Western players. So uh, Wang Hao, a very interesting novelty to defeat uh, Fabiano Corana in the Reykjavik tournament. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, the 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.